and friends, and welcome to this Vice Chancellor's Distinguished uh, Research Award. And I will hold this microphone very still because it doesn't seem to do vibrations well. The Research Award recognizes excellence, innovation, and dedication in research by a Rhodes University academic. And this evening, this is an, this is an evening uh, in which we, as academic peers, colleagues, students, family, friends, and members of the public celebrate the intellectual and scholarly achievements of one of our own academics. And tonight, we are privileged to celebrate and learn more about the work of Professor Palani Mashazi, the 2021 Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Research Award recipient. Professor Mashazi's research spans the areas of electrochemistry, nanomaterials, design and fabrication, and organometallic materials. His work aims to advance the production of low-priced, easy-to-use sensors and biosensors for the detection of monitoring uh, for the detection and monitoring of diseases and viruses. The work has its application in the early and widespread detection of con communicable diseases such as measles, tuberculosis, human immunodeficiency virus, and of course recently COVID-19 and also non-communicable diseases such as cancer and cardiovascular disease. But first, a little bit about the person we are celebrating. Professor Mashazi grew up in rural KwaZulu-Natal, where he completed his schooling up to, the, up to grade 12. He was inspired by several of his teachers who saw his potential and encouraged him to attend university which had, up to that point, not seemed like a real possibility for him. In fact, before his teachers brought up the idea of going to university, the young Polani was toying with the idea of becoming a taxi driver. After he settled on Rhodes University as his tertiary education institution of choice, carefully chosen words, by the way, the young Mashazi completed a Bachelor of Science degree majoring in chemistry and computer science. It was during his third year that he started to hone in on what was be to become his primary research interest later, namely nanobiosensors development. He completed an honors degree and then a master's degree in chemistry. During his master's degree, he published four research articles and right there began began Professor Mashazi's steep research tra trajectory. That's really not bad. His MSc research was sponsored by the mineral research organization, Mintech, and Professor Mashazi went on to work there as a research scientist from 2007 to 2013. And during his time at Mintech, he completed his PhD degree part-time, after which he returned to Rhodes University as a senior lecturer and established the Nanobiosensors Research Group. Since his return, Professor Mashazi has supervised to completion a number of masters and doctoral students and has successfully attracted several national equipment and research grants to the, tunes of, uh, to the tune of many millions of rand. He regularly appears in the university's annual research report as one of our institutional higher achievers. In fact, I need to mention this, Professor Mashazi working with distinguished Professor Nia Kong and the other colleagues in the Institute for Nanotechnology Innovation comprised the most productive research group in the history of our university. He has contributed as an academic citizen in many ways, taking on the role of Deputy Director of the Institute, uh, becoming an academic staff representative on Senate and a Senate representative on the Research Committee. Mr. Mashazi has also been involved in several community engagement projects, most notably the Rhodes University Dialogue, which coordinates events aimed at promoting scientific literacy. He's a recent member of the core team that advises the National Department of Science and Innovation on the requirements for nano micro manufacturing. And he's also a board member of the African Network for Electroanalytical Chemistry. All of his peer reviewers for this particular award 
agree that Professor Mashazi has an outstanding research profile for his relatively early career stage. The extent and quality of his international uh, peer-reviewed publications uh, are a strong and critical basis for this research award, which recognizes quality, novelty, and impact as addressed through the eyes of peer reviewers. When describing his research, one of the uh, peer reviewers noted that, and I'm quoting, Professor Palani Mashazi's CV is a testament to an outstanding young scientist, researcher, and, and, and academic. So it is my honor tonight to invite Professor Mashazi to deliver his 2021 Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Award Lecture. Professor Mashazi. Um, good evening, TVC Research. Thank you very much for the kind words, uh, Prof. Clayton. I appreciate the words you've, you've said. I'm wondering if that was me being talked about on the stage. <laughs> um, TVC, Student Affairs and Academic Affairs. Um, the dean that are present here, I can see a couple. Thank you very much for gracing me with your presence. The head of departments, I can also see a few around. Thank you very much. Um, deputy deans, if they are present, um, HOD's colleagues, I'm very excited to see quite a number of them around. Um, some of them have left our department to other departments, but they see, still see this as a fitting tribute to come and see my lecture. Thank you. Um, the students, obviously, I cannot thank you enough. Um, because really, um, what I'm about to present, I'm not going to be lying to say it's, it's my work. Only thing that I do is just request for reports. Every um, quarter, I request for presentations. Sometimes, my goodness, they tolerate me even on weekends. They do come through. So um, thank you very much. And... Uh, um, just to say a few, I've got a few of my colleagues as well here from the Department of Chemistry. Um, I think that's one department I need to give credit to in terms of um, this achievement. Just a few weeks back or a month, we were having the same lecture from one of the members of our staff, Professor Lop, who shared amongst you the various aspects of our department, and he received a teaching award. Um, for 2021. And um, really, I think it comes out of the leadership of the, of the department that we come out to be um, award winners. The collegiality that is taking place within that department, it um, goes without say, it's really something that should be marveled by other departments. But in addition to that, I think I thank the research office for the support. I see um, some of the research office staff is here as well. I appreciate that. And um, yeah, so for me, I also just need to give a word of thanks to Professor Mabizela because this is his award. He decided to give it to me. I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful to the university as well for receiving this award. My title, the title of my presentation, if I were to just share, has it been shared already? It looks like it has. Okay. It is titled Finding a Nickel in a Haystack, a quest for ultra-sensitive and affordable diagnostic systems. That's a lie. Don't read anything into that. You will get to see why I say that. But first, before I continue, I need to give thanks to the men that shaped my life in ways that I cannot even begin to imagine. That is um, the man I call my father. Um, he passed on on the 4th of August, 2020. It was a difficult year, just when the COVID started and we were trying to learn how to flatten the curve, 
and all those terminologies and what is COVID and that. And um, he was also diabetic. And apparently that was the bad comorbidity with COVID. Um, he went into a hospital and a few days later, when I got a call to say he passed, it was really a sad moment. Just to give thanks to him, um, the praise name, the Mashazi praise name is Tabane Zele Zuelbans Oma Kalela Kasele Jengen Gonyam O Lindam Kond. That's where I come from. That's my clan name. And yeah, we celebrate him. I know that whoever he is is looking upon and saying, I would have been there. <laughs> he always said, um, because he couldn't believe that I'm at university and teaching. He's like, so you stand in front of people, students, and you talk English for 45 minutes. Don't you just mix the words? I'm like, there's no way you can mix the words. It's not, it doesn't happen. You've got to speak English all the way through. Um, yeah, so he would have been very excited and he would have been here definitely. So I give this presentation to, to him. <clears throat> In this work, I've also cooperated a lot, and some of the names are quite familiar. Others are kind of unfamiliar. Most importantly, please look at this quadrant here for the current research students, as well as the quadrant on the right-hand side, some of my um, past students. And the ones highlighted in blue have, in one way or the other, contributed to the presentation you're gonna be seeing today. But I've also just thought I'll, I'll acknowledge the other systems that really we work with um, closely. Research office, obviously, they are amazing. I've never called on them, then never responded positively, and I'm grateful for that. EM unit, oh my goodness, our research wouldn't go on without them. Um, Mintech, obviously, we do go to them to tap into their system. It is a uh, system recognized by the NRF, so we do use it. You would see a few, if not two slides, on CHPC computing, the work that we did there. And to give thanks to Professor um, Justin Bishop and her staff, who really, um, I shouldn't be saying this, because you haven't approved my sabbatical report. <laughs> Dr. Clayton. But the first six months of my sabbatical, which was not motivated for, but I saw it fitting that I, I should do, I attended the bioinformatics course. And Prof. Uh, Bishop gave me a leeway to attend without paying. Hopefully, nobody's in from accounting here. So um, from that, we have really, I've really used a lot of their systems in terms of understanding what we are doing. <clears throat> And also just to give thanks to the funders, um, Rhodes University, obviously, through research office. Oh, my goodness. Um, Prof. Nyokong, the Institute for Nanotechnology University, uh, Innovation, I cannot thank them enough. I'm able to do what I do is because of the availability of that institute. It is really what we refer to as a one-stop shop. You make a material, you take your material, you carry it in your hand, you go from one instrument to the other, to the other, to the other. When you get out of the, you write a publication, I'm joking. Um, so we really have quite a, an awesome tools that I get to play with as well. Obviously, um, the MRC, South African MRC, they funded this, some of these projects. NRF, I'm still part of the NIC Mintech as well. Um, recently, we received a bilateral with Sweden through the Umia University that is um, here. So some of the research you will see as well um, spans from that. Finding a needle in a haystack. What's so nice about these days is you get these things called memes on the internet. If you don't know what a meme is, don't ask because you'll reveal your age. So, so I was just like, what is this phrase anyway? And then, how does it relate to my work? Obviously, as you look there, a gentleman is really trying to look for a needle. And that's how a haystack looks like. <clears throat> that, I think, it represents my research in its entirety. But if I give that to students, it will be too easy. 
they will go in and comb through that and find the needle and then the research disappears. So we make it a little bit complicated. So how we complicate it? I say, don't look for a needle. Look for something that exists within a billions and billions of other molecules in a single drop of blood. So that's something that you would find there. Should be specific to either one of those um, diseases. Communicable diseases, if you are looking at the, uh, the measles, you can detect um, antibodies specific to measles. You can detect antibodies specific to COVID-19, TB, HIV, those are non-communicable. Or you can look and say, if somebody presents symptoms of cancer, why don't we find something that is, um, has been expressed by the body that will be a, a selective enough to give an indication that somebody is cancer positive or diabetes or that. Um, my work started off with diabetes. I was doing um, MSc. A lot of work started from there. Obviously, the justification was my dad had diabetes. I wanted to understand those systems far better. So we did a lot of research with that. So, and then we did cancer, um, cardiovascular diseases, CVD. Um, and then one of the recent research that we are doing now is looking at ways of utilizing nanomaterials as artificial enzymes. We discovered <clears throat> through literature that you can actually pre uh, prepare these nanomaterials and you can then evaluate their applications. And somehow they mimic the same properties as the enzymes do in certain uh, conditions. So we then were like, why don't we look into those? And we've done a lot of work looking at monometallic species, metal oxides, Biometallic species, you would see these come through as I present. However, I just think for the sake of time, I'll just try to focus my research on cancer for this presentation. Reason being, there's quite some very exciting studies that are coming out of that. I'm cherry picking on my project. So, and also there's a lot of work again, I would mention that, that we do on thyrosine and electrochemical sensors and that, but I'll just choose that one. <clears throat> this should be a familiar picture to everybody in the room, actually. COVID started. Everybody was afraid to meet their friends, their families, their boyfriends, and everyone. So what was happening at the time is we knew that there's a virus that is transmittable by aerosol, which means if you breathe, um, the same atmosphere with the person that is infected, you are most likely going to be um, infected um, by the same <coughs> disease. So typical of electrochemists or biosensor or diagnostic people, what then we do, we sit down and say, okay, fine. If that's the case, what is happening on this virus? Oh, we've got a protein. Um, it's enveloped by a protein. Those black um, bubbles there, those are the proteins that basically can help us assist or diagnose or see that this virus is there. And then if we can produce a protein that can capture this in a selective and specific manner, then we'll be able to design a biosensor. So if we take this, we attach it to the surface, electrode surface. And by just looking at this interaction here, we can get to see a signal of interest where when you don't have, um, COVID, you'll still retain a signal that is going to be as, as this black, uh, black dots. Should you have a, um, a virus, then you will produce an enhanced signal, which is that. And that basically from doing that, you've got yourself a COVID-19 diagnostic. I'm making it very easy also. Um, it doesn't really work like that. It's just a simplistic version of it. However, the principle um, stays the same. So by doing that, we're looking at, therefore, then we can detect the virus itself as it is um, produced in the system, or the body works in mysterious ways in that when it sees something that has infected the body, it tries to fight it off. 
So we, it says the body develops immunity. And this, what happens, the body then produces some chemical compounds, some biochemical compounds, something that will go and try to kill um, whatever the pathogen or the virus that has, has um, entered its body. So we sometimes don't detect directly the virus because this usually is in very small concentration. So we tend to look for what the body produces in billions per second. So that then gives us an indication of how these systems work. The classical example of this is your HIV tests. It doesn't look for an HIV virus. It looks for antibodies that the body produces in the presence of the virus. And one of the methods of a direct detection is your pregnancy test, where we're looking for the hormone HCG that is present in the body when somebody gets pregnant. So you can do a direct method or an indirect method. Both of them will give you an indication. Obviously, it's simpler for um, diseases that you either need to know whether or not you are pregnant, whether or not you are HIV positive. <clears throat> but one of the research that we did, which was really interesting for me, and um, it came out of a bilateral research with uh, Umia uh, through Stint, was looking at can we monitor anti-cancer drugs? So somebody presents with cancer and then they are diagnosed positive, then they go through chemotherapy. And during that process, um, then uh, chemotherapy hopefully kills cancer and you are cleared. But we discover, discovered that sometimes it doesn't really work as simple as that, okay? You give a certain drug, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And we need to change its properties or its concentration during the measurement. This work we published in 2021, where we looked at, can we design a biosensor that can detect this molecule? It's called methotrexate. It is one of the drugs that are given during chemotherapy. It's very good. It's an antifolate metabolite. It inhibits DNA synthesis and cell replication. That is very good for cancer. And it also successfully treats uh, rheumatic um, arthritis. But its important role in this case is as a chemo uh, chemotherapy agent. However, if you take a single dose that is generally accepted, it doesn't always work with everyone. It doesn't always work with everyone. So, then you've got to play around with parameters. You increase the concentration, you decrease the concentration. If you increase it, if you're seeing that there's no therapeutic effect, then you need to increase the concentration. You increase it for someone else, someone else gets sick, they start losing their hair, they start losing their weight, which means it's toxic. So we need to monitor um, online how this um, side effects basically affects the, um, the patient. However, it also gets some, has some side effects, which are Gastrointestinal disorder. Um, sorry. Um, hematologic disorders, as well as nephrotoxicity, pneumonitis. Um, all of these are some of the side effects when really you are giving a drug to somebody that is not compatible in terms of um, the applications. So then we set out to look at can we design a system that can monitor this online whilst the therapy is happening. So in a natural sense or normal sense of doing things is that you basically take a drug as you arrive at the hospital, then it's intended concentration. This is just the drug in a plasma increases between these two green lines. That's where the concentration is supposed to stay. There you get your therapy window to okay. However, we see that sometimes it actually decreases to low concentrations over time leading to poor therapeutic effect or it increases beyond the therapeutic window which leads then to toxicity. So during that space then we need to make sure that we are monitoring it online and to establish what response should the GP or your doctors give you if you are showing the signs of toxicity and or you are showing no effect at all in the um, towards the drug. So these are very important and 
nicely for us, um, electrochemistry does assist in terms of quantifying how much exactly um, the drug is present in one's body or blood plasma. And from there, then we can deduce what either we can increase the concentration or we decrease the concentration. The system we set out to design was um, this system. What was nice about it as well is that through research, we had discovered that um, MTX, it's both used in South Africa and in Sweden for in the chemotherapy. So it was um, a nice system that it would be holistic working all over um, the two countries. So this system is basically a PDMS with the gold um, slides on either side. And from there you can apply the potential and measure the impedance. If there's a slight shift in impedance, then we know that um, that person is showing an increase in drug uptake. If it doesn't increase at all, so it means that we need to inject a little bit more. Obviously, that's the simplistic version again. Um, we did some research onto that. We're looking at what can be um, done in this system here. Um, in UMIA, they are very good at um, multivariate data analysis. So we did use a pH studies where we looked at the variation of the signal in the presence of the, um, the drug and the signal in the absence of the drug. So we're doing cycles of in injecting the drug through the system and removing it by just running it in the buffer. We saw, we saw that we could reproduce um, the baseline with some variations. Um, and also we can see that there is an increase in the, um, the signal between the two, the baseline as well as the drug, um, if it's present in solution. Obviously these systems, I'm not gonna go into detail with them. Some of it were done in classic carbon electrode, the one that's top, the ones at the bottom were done in a screen protected electrode, which is really something that is already online that can be monitored. From which we then can deduce that we can monitor the concentration of the drug from 0.1 uh, picomolar to about a millimolar concentration in a linear range. So that was actually quite good. We can get very nice detection limits for both the systems. And we then concluded that we can basically measure um, the, this uh, system online. Challenge became, how does it work? You know, when you're trying to send a paper for publication, there's always gonna be like, yeah, we see that it's working, but how does it really work? This is the work that I did um, after attending a course on molecular modeling, just to show how the drug in the cavity of the antibody interacts with the light chain molecules as well as the heavy chain um, moieties of the drug. And from there, we could actually dock the drugs in the, in the protein and we could see it basically binding very strongly to the antibody. But what was very convincing, and I think the reviewers got excited about that because they were saying this for the first time, was the fact that by just looking at we are seeing that there is a change in the radius of gyration when you've got the ligand bound, which is your MTX, then when you don't have it bound. The decrease in diameter or in the radius was a confirmation. And also the root mean square um, deviation was also an indication when it got very stable, very early, whereas for the protein by itself, it takes a while to stabilize. So the signal that we observed was due to the interactions between the ligand as well as the, the, um, the drug itself. So it made a protein compact and therefore we could monitor the capacitance. Obviously that was nice, we published it and I was like, so what's next Daniel? And he was like, uh, talk. It's so it. I'm like, no, 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 we continue working. We don't just stop now that we find something that works. What's next? So we then investigated that there is another way that obviously that was good for monitoring the drugs. In another instance is we can detect the PSA. PSA is a prostate specific antigen, very much important um, uh, protein 
that is produced from somebody who is showing symptoms of um, having prostate, prostate cancer. And obviously, as you can see, this was a collaborative work from Mr. Mwanza to Ms. Mfamela, as well as um, the postdoc, um, Mr. Omotayo Adeni. And from this work, we decided, okay, let's look at this and see what can be done. Um, the previous system, it works very well. In real life, really, would it work? We had um, some um, challenges there. In this system, we thought if we take glucose, it's what we use to measure for somebody who's got, who's got diabetes, we can encapsulate it within the nanoliposome. So you've got a nice spherical material that encapsulates a number of glucose molecules. We can then tag this with an antibody that is specific to PSA, and we can detect PSA, PSA. And once we've done that, we can then detect the prostate cancer. So we set out to look at how do we formulate the nanoliposomes and how do we quantify them. We chose a series of molecules with its intended purposes. Um, CHEMS, which is cholesterol hemisocinate, was chosen because it would allow for the encapsulation as well as the release of glucose. We want it out of the liposomes at some point. Um, phosphatidylcholine, as well as um, olylamido butyric acid, we can then, with this, we can basically mobilize the antibody. So we formed this. It's a very simple one step process. You mix everything up, you put it in an organic molecule after some time it forms a spherical um, particle like that with the aqueous 